Bueno, buenas tardes. Vamos a empezar el nombre. En... Good evening. Let's get started. On the behalf of uh, Mr. Raimundo Perez Fernandez, I would like to give the floor to, to welcome you. My name is David Santin. I work at University of Complutense in Madrid as a, t as a professor with the area of social sciences of the uh, foundation and uh, in different activities. I would like to start by thanking this, this is a conference that we give together with University Carlos III of Madrid. And I would like to thank this institution for the partnership. He, um, the universities are very interesting and important partner. And I would like to say uh, thank you to thank Richard and Professor Richard Blandon for having accepted this invitation to be here at the foundation. I would like to thank also Professor Antonio Gabrales, who has been uh, promoting this idea and sponsoring and uh, um, they've promoted the idea of talking about the latest research results uh, of the uh, topic and he's going to act as a moderator during this session. I would like to thank as well Professor Juan Wanfu, who has been the link who has been uh, between uh, different parties and has been actually carrying out everything in terms of organization. And I would like to thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, without you, this activity sh wouldn't uh, mean anything at all. So today we're going to talk about public economics. And these online webinars are very good, but they're just the second best compared to uh, um, in-person or presential uh, um, conference, which is much more attractive. I would like to pass the floor to Professor Cabrales, but before anything else, um, for those who don't are not familiar with what we do at Foundation Areces, I would like to say that the Foundation has a single goal, which is promoting science, excellence of science in Spain. In order to achieve this goal, the Foundation carries out a number of activities that I would like to uh, classifying three areas. The first one is uh, training of cap human capital through the postgraduate studies and uh, the um, scholarship program. Uh, we help people to do their PhDs, postgraduate courses in the best uh, universities in the world, like the PH University College in London, where um, Professor Blandon comes. Uh, and the second area is uh, uh, supporting uh, research excellent researchers and uh, we have this uh, a program that actually supports uh, younger researchers to become senior researchers and finally the third pillar that brings us together here today is to be a link a um, focal point between excellent science and society at large, society which is interesting in the latest scientific research results and outcomes and uh, evidence and in order to know what they are uh, researching, what research is about. For this purpose, we have a number of strategic alliances with prestigious uh, institutions like MIT, the Carlos III, the London School of Economics, and other institutions, many other institutions that are excellent institutions, but I'm not going to list today. Okay, then, thank you very much again for being here with us. And I think we're going to enjoy uh, Professor Blunder conference. Uh, and I would like to pass the floor now to Professor Cabrales. Hello. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much. This talk takes place because we were going to invite what, because some, somebody suggested why we, uh, we should invite uh, Richard Blandell to uh, give this talk. And I knew about the uh, work that he was carrying out for the Eaton Review, the study on inequality, and I thought, what a pity, somebody who has an in-depth uh, vision about one of the most important things that we should be dealing with uh, as economists and as society 
the fact that this uh, a society that I, I mean we should um, sort of disseminate this because um, it, it should go beyond the um, borders of our university Carlos III we were lucky enough therefore to have the um, opportunity to have this uh, uh, organize this talk. I am going to speak in English now because we are going to talk about the virtues and the outcomes and uh, achievements uh, about Professor Blandell. I'm not going to change to English because I'm going to talk about you and uh, I want you to correct me if I say something wrong or stupid, uh, which I might. So, Professor Blandell is one of the top economists in the world, uh, as recognized by a long series of recognitions. I won't say all. Uh, so, for example, I won't say the number of honorary doctorates he holds, because even himself he has uh, forgotten about them, and they don't, they don't, uh, they're not any, anywhere to be counted. But, for example, he's had the Yuryu Janssen Prize for his work in microeconometrics and the analysis of labor supply that gives the European Economic Association together with the Yuryu Janssen Foundation. Um, he uh, has the Econometric Society Frisch Prize Medal in, in 2000, so the first one in 95, this one in 2000, the, uh, for the paper Estimating Labor Supply Responses Using Tax Reforms, the Jean-Jacques Lafont Prize uh, given to high-level economists whose research combines both theoretical and applied aspects in economics, the CES IFO Prize, uh, the Sanmo Prize, the ASCA Prize in Labor Economics, the VVA uh, Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Prize in Economics, the Erwin Plain Nemers Economics Prize, and a lot more that I, you know, probably he has forgotten as well. They all uh, are given for his contributions to labor economics, public finance, and applied econometrics. So that's a person that is combining knowledge in very important applied fields from labor economics to public economics to uh, kind of the methods that are necessary for doing this right. And this is the kind of thing that the uh, Ramon Arethes Foundation wants to promote and that the universities in Madrid, the, the people that are here that we want to promote. Now, as the recognitions that I've mentioned make clear, uh, the range of contributions for Professor Blandell are nothing short of completely astounding. He has developed micro database models for intertemporal decisions over labor supply behavior and the interaction between consumer and labor supplies behavior. We have developed new microeconometric micro tools for the study of dynamic panel data models and the non-parametric analysis of individual decisions. There's really no branch of decision, of analysis of the individual and aggregate decisions for he, he has not provided both great advances and developed the necessary statistical techniques. Um, now, the reason why he has done this, it's this data analysis and this model, is because he's very interested in uh, having models and methods that support policy making in those areas that are informed by the most rigorously uh, methods that, that is possible. So this interconnection between the deepest science and the interest for public policy and developing in, in, a, in a good way is not just uh, uh, important, it's, it's the way to make progress. It's deep science with important uh, applications in, in, for humanity. Many people here in the audience, like Professor Arellano, Olympia Bover, people in here are doing the same thing. Uh, we're just a community of scholars that are dedicated to improving the life of, uh, of people by using the best methods available. That's not always understood about economics, and, and, and this work of the foundation is important to try to put forward the idea that you can only do progress in economics, like in medicine, like in other disciplines, by using the best science available. Uh, beyond that, uh, Professor Blandell has also been a leader in different, uh, in different uh, institutions. Like, for example, he's been the head of the economics department at University College London, which, when he arrived, was, let's be fair, not particularly distinguished. And now it's perhaps the best in Europe and one of the best in the world. He has been research director in the Institute for Fiscal Studies. He's been the president of the European Economic Association, the Econometric Society, the Society for Labor Economics, so he is a contributor to public goods, also the Royal Economic Society. That's something that, that academics also ought to do, not just contribute in, in, uh, to, in the pu public sphere, but also in the, in the institutions that uh, govern science. 
He's also been a mentor for young people. He's had graduate students out of University College London that are now professors at MIT, Stanford, Yale, among other places. So all the best universities in the world, including Carlos III, have uh, people that have been trained by Richard or by people that, that, like him. He's also collaborated with governments. He's been in the advisory board to the Mexican government and, and uh, the Presidential Pension Commission in Chile. He engages frequently with UK government at all levels. So that's the kind of academic that we ought to foster in general, and, and he's a great example for all of us. Today, he's going to be talking about, we were discussing earlier, what are the three key problems that economists ought to study these days. So one of them is inequality, the other probably is uh, productivity, and the third one probably is climate change. These are the central problems, and as I've already discussed, he's made essential contributions to understand them at the deepest level. Like, develop the methods, develop the, the data, and you know, the models, the theory, and then test them and, and make advances. That's the way to go. And that's, uh, and that's what he's going to give us a great example today by talking about uh, inequality and the COVID crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio. Thanks for inviting me here. It's great to be back. It's great to be back after two years of not doing almost anything in person. And so to be at both back in Madrid and at an event like this, fantastic. And uh, thank you for your very generous. Uh, I mean, the way I work is with lots of other people. And l luckily, I get all the credit, it seems. But uh, no, I think research like we now do in economics is a team-based kind of work, and um, that's what I've always thought was the way to go forward. And this work I'm going to talk about here is very much about that. Um, it's a public lecture, so it's very general. There won't be any detailed methods in this. Um, but what I wanted to do was think about the implications for inequality of uh, COVID, post-COVID economy. And um, one reason for doing that is that just before COVID um, broke out, uh, we'd started an inequality review chaired by Angus Deaton at the Institute of Fiscal Studies called the Deaton Review of Inequalities. It's inequalities because not just about one inequality, it's about the range of inequalities. And when we were beginning, in fact, in the, in the January, uh, just after we began, we were sitting there as a panel. I'll give you a little bit of background to the review. And we were looking at each other thinking, well, maybe inequality will be off the agenda now because now we have a health crisis. And it looks like it's hitting rich cities and rich people more than anyone else. And the reason was is that in Europe, it had hit the Milan or the northern Itali Italian area. In the UK, it was London, and in particular, the more higher income parts of London, i.e. all those people that typically travel and remember it had come off the back of a, a holiday vacation, <laughs> the first infection. And, uh, but it didn't take long, of course, to realize that, in fact, um, the breadth of inequalities that we're looking at in this review were the right set to look at. And in fact, that's the way I'm going to start this, by um, kind of thinking about uh, uh, the role of inequality or what happened. And as I say here, far from pushing inequality down the agenda, the pandemic has reinforced the need uh, to deal with the challenges of inequality. And what I'm going to do is run through the set of them, really, and think about how they interact together. And uh, you could... Obviously, it's clear that the, many of the existing inequalities that we're already focused on, education, training, income, work, I could go through them all, and I will in a minute, um, all became accentuated. 
And there were other ones too. They're kind of opening up uh, what we call kind of new fissures of, along dimensions that were previously less significant, working at home, digital access, and space at home. And then the kind of question is we're coming out of it now and is, you know, is this a time for a, a new emphasis on building a fairer society? Uh, but of course we've got the challenge of doing so with unprecedented, I put peacetime debt, I did this before the, uh, I thought of this before the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, but it's still the highest levels of peacetime debt more or less across uh, Europe. Of course, that may be uh, important to build a fairer society, but at the same time, what's happened with COVID is, um, is a focus on technology and the importance of technology. And um, going along with that, of course, is increase in education premium and working from home, both things that are associated with higher skilled individuals and higher income families. What we've had is probably the biggest success in the, in the history of uh, dealing with, uh, with um, big, bad economic events, at least, um, in particular in uh, addressing current inequality. If you don't know already, and I'll, I'll give you some statistics, but this is the first recession we've had where inequality didn't go up in almost any account, it measured inequality by the genie, I should add. By the way, Angus Deaton, if he knew I was even mentioning the genie, would, it would run me off the stage. Uh, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, uh, uh, but it has been very successful. If you compare it to the financial uh, recession, uh, you'll see some movements in the genie, some immediate increases, possibly. Huge increases in inequality without policy response. But with policy response, inequality has kept fairly stable and in some parts of in some countries it's actually fallen and then there's been the vaccine success I guess a big surprise uh, which has helped speed up recovery but of course what's happened is that almost puts a gloss on what's going on underneath which is the kind of long-term inequality challenges which are more or less all exactly as they were and I Want, that's what I want to focus on here. And as we're sitting, I'm sitting at the Institute of Fiscal Studies where we think a lot about addressing inequality through tax and welfare, then it's obvious that these, this kind of large set of long-term inequalities won't be addressed completely at least uh, by simple tax and welfare reform. And so the key part of the Deaton Review is about getting a balance of reforms uh, across the whole set of policies that can impact on the adverse features of inequality because we don't think all inequalities are bad, of course. The idea of the review is that just like other reviews that we've done, and I'll mention those a little bit as I'm going through, it's the UK is the kind of running experimental example. It's a good one for many things. It's been a good one for COVID. It's a good one for inequality. It sits quite high up in the inequality uh, rank, um, right, just a little ahead of Spain, by the way, as, as you'll see. And uh, it, it's going to be our running example through this, but it's also comparative. So we're in the middle of this, just a few slides background, because what we're trying to do at the moment is now engage with everybody. Um, we've already had a number of studies, and I'll explain what we're doing. As I said, this is about the way we're doing it. It's not really going to tell you all the depth. Uh, but it is broad, and it's about which inequalities matter most um, uh, and how they're related and what are the underlying driving forces. I guess we kind of have seen the descriptions of inequality, top 1%, Gini, and what have you. And the idea here is to go uh, underneath those uh, statistics and think about what is the right mix of policies. So it's comparative, and just to remind you where the UK sits in the Gini, this is on household disposable income just before the pandemic, you can see that the G, it's way below, of course, or below the US, which in the way I've selected the countries here, 
is at the top end. Of course, that sits below economies in Latin America and in, and in Africa, but it's still high. And Spain is a little below that, but not very far below. But economies that we think of and we know have very similar GDPs per capita and rates of growth, all the other things that we look at, uh, manage to do so with considerably less inequality than we do in the UK. And so we want to, that's why comparative is so important. And if you know the history of the UK, um, we used to have a genie much like you see that Germany has now. By the way, German inequality has risen quite substantially over the last 20, 30 years. And we also moved from a kind of mid to northern Europe style Gini to catch up with the US in terms of inequality. But as we know, the US is a leader and it kept on increasing and has stayed out there in front. And another idea of the comparative nature is to kind of think about where we're trending. Are we, you know, is it the case that it's inevitable that we will end up with the kind of inequalities and, and levels of them that we see in the US? Or is there a way of redesigning uh, the functioning of the economy like that? So we want to look at a range of inequalities here in wealth, work, consumption, education, health, not just economic inequalities. So the team that's running the Deaton Review, which I'll go through briefly, is, is interdisciplinary. And it's not just about individual inequalities and differences between individuals and families. It's about differences between groups as well. And obviously, a lot of the inequalities that concern people are between groups like gender, generations, race, and place. And it's comparative, this is just nice pictures. Um, so it has Angus Deaton in the chair, and um, we're, and a bunch of people, including me here, but I'll pick on a few faces just to kind of point out the way we're thinking of this review. Uh, firstly, probably um, down at the bottom right, you're may be familiar with Jean Tirole, who's a Nobel Prize winner like Angus is, um, but not normally thought of as someone who works on inequality. Uh, but if you think about it for a moment, uh, what Jean is working on is on the regulation of di digital, uh, digital technologies and the way they're used by firms in the market. And of course, if we think about the kind of challenges to inequality in the labor market and also the accumulation of um, wealth by um, particularly superstar firms, for example, that's exactly where that, um, those firms are based in typically in digital platform technologies. And so to kind of think about regulation or addressing inequality that we might concern us around those types of uh, firms, then you need to think about competition policy and regulation. Uh, and that's why we brought in expertise like that. Alongside um, Jean on the, if I come towards me, is, is someone you may not know, Deborah Satz, who's a brilliant uh, philosopher of, uh, of, uh, of uh, inequality, actually, at Stanford, and she's the head of social science at Stanford, but a brilliant, uh, if you haven't read her work, uh, she's very brilliant. And kind of brings a dimension about thinking about the ethics and the concerns of uh, inequality. And then alongside them are sociologists, and people who study families, and uh, epidemiologists, and scattered among some uh, economists that many of you will know as well, and I'm not going to. Uh, but of course, the idea there was to bring together a group that you wouldn't typically associate with inequality itself, because we're interested in how trade, technology, and variety of things affect inequality, and of course, political, um, political voice as well. What we're doing, we have um, a large number of studies. In fact, we started with 12, now we've got 19. I've listed 16 here, and they're all done. So if you go on the website, that's why we're in the moment of releasing all of these. Each one is a chapter by uh, key people in the field. It typically, uh, following Antonio's kind of idea that we try and engage with young researchers, it's a senior kind of international expert with one young, at least one young researcher 
typically based at IFS and doing their PhD, and then a set of commentaries. And so all in all, there are, there are um, well over 50 leading experts plus many other researchers involved in this. And the way it's going to come out is the book of evidence. That's where we are now, which is these studies. And then the panel will get together and led by Angus Deaton write a book about everything. And we've also got country studies, which is something that we, we thought of as we were going along because it became so important to understand what was going on elsewhere. And of course, we have uh, Olympia and Laura and the group at um, Banco España who are putting together the, um, the, compa the, the kind of comparative work on, on Spain. And now this is uh, leading to a huge amount of interesting work, which is, I think, going to have uh, an important impact, actually, across a wide range, mainly on the economics of inequality and its foundations. OK, so that was a little bit of background. And then if we think about where we were prior to the pandemic, um, and I'm going to run through them just in a way that I want to think of the pandemic as well. So we were already, in fact, the way we thought about the inequalities review was uh, to take look at education outcomes and parental inputs. We'd already had concern about the increases in the inequality of inputs and outputs and outcomes um, by sociological background. And then the kind of decline in opportunities in the labor market for uh, those that don't graduate from universities. And uh, that's a kind of key theme there. And part of the work of the, com of the uh, country studies is going to be looking at that because some countries seem to be much more successful at the non-university group than uh, the UK and especially the US is. If we look at the kind of key things underlying it, then typically in most economies there's been an increase in earnings inequality, even if there wasn't an increase, such a big increase in income inequality, in particular of male earnings inequality. For example, even though you don't see much increase in overall inequality, family income inequality in many economies in Europe, including in Germany and Norway and other northern uh, European economies, if you just look at male earnings inequality, then you find an increase. And that's a kind of key feature of, of this kind of work, going from the individual earnings inequality through to family inequality and then through to uh, disposable income inequality. And that's been, uh, at least in some economies, like the UK and the US in particular, We've had a sequence of adverse shocks to the labor market, uh, especially those in the middle and towards the bottom, and then very poor wage progression for lower educated workers, which has become a kind of key theme. There was a time, certainly when I was involved in, um, in designing welfare to work policy 25 years ago, we thought that the key idea was to get people into a job. It's turned out that hasn't been a very successful route. Uh, because even if individuals are in a job, it turns out that wage progression for many jobs, particularly increasing set of jobs that I'm going to look at a little bit here, is very flat. And so we find in the UK in particular, but in the US as well, we can have families going through their lifetime in work, uh, either at the poverty line or below it, or at least in receipt of some transfers. So not insurance at all, really. And um, that's a key uh, feature. Some of it's to do with part-time work, uh, but most of it's to do with the low rates of on-the-job training, increasing de decline in on-the-job training for many, right across many economies for low-educated workers. So what we've got is this case where employment alone is increasingly not enough to escape poverty and low earnings or give you wage progression, and this gives you a kind of new definition of what sometimes we might phrase as good jobs, jobs that lead to some kind of career progression. And I'll come back to that a little bit. But alongside the, the increase in equality for men, there's been an increase in, typically across most economies in fact, an increase in the labor supply of, of women. And um, 
And you might think that would offset some of the increase in inequality for men, but in fact, uh, there's such strong assortativeness among partnering in, in couples, together with relatively low, still low wages, relative wages for women, that there's relatively little offset in earnings inequality. And you'll see that in some of the pictures I'll go, th I'll go through here. But there, and then of course there's large differences in the prosperity of different groups, and regional inequality is perhaps the most important one here. And I guess it's something that economists, at least many economists, including me, typically ignore was the importance of inequality geographically. And if you think of what's happened to, uh, to um, the literature on trade and inequality, where the two, su the two subjects were almost uh, not linked at all, and now the impact of trade on geographical inequality is considered to be one of the most important. As far as I can see, the impact of geographical of trade on geographical inequality one of the, the one of the places where that's been biggest has been in Spain at least that's what we're finding in the review so uh, this is an important aspect and then alongside the other concerns are those an increase in wealth inequality and uh, I'll uh, I'll come back to all of that I haven't put much on health or mortality or whatever. Of course, with Angus Deaton chairing this, that's a big feature, but I can't cover everything. If you look at the evolution of Gini uh, with and without policy, it is quite remarkable. There's a whole set of studies now. If you haven't seen them, it's, not, uh, it's descriptive, of course, uh, but you can see that um, without policy response, of course, there'd be an increase in inequality pretty much across the board in almost every economy. With policy response, you see typically either no change or even a decline. And I was trying to dig out some data for, um, for Spain. Uh, there's, it's always difficult to get up-to-date data on inequality and how it's progressing through the pandemic. So I ended up t turning to this work on the inequality tracker that um, in particular, Jose Montalvo and, uh, and colleagues working with the Kiaxa Bank have put together, which does seem to get its, its real-time huge data set. It doesn't, uh, one reason for doing this is there are different views about what's happened in Spain. And as far as I can tell, this seems to get it just about right. This is in the first part of the wave. And this looks at um, pre-transfers and post-transfers in, um, in, in, in income inequality. And you can see this big jump up at the beginning and then it comes down in pre-transfers, but almost a, a very, very small and getting towards relatively negligible change in inequality uh, towards the end of the year. In fact, it does pop up again. Uh, digging into this a little bit more detail, I've been trying to do this before coming here um, just to see what's going on. And, of course, exactly the same story everywhere. The pre-transfer inequality is much higher and most immediate among the youngest group. So uh, this group over here, this is just following the months of the first wave. And you can see um, the 16 to 29-year group get the big hit. Uh, but, of course, they also get quite a lot of the transfers, uh, and you can see that opening out. There's some fantastic, I've been playing around, this data's all online, so I've been playing around with it, and you can do some remarkably uh, useful things. It doesn't align perfectly with every data set, but of course, because you can go into the detail, you can begin to get uh, differences by demographic. This is just simple difference differences, really, taking you through the pandemic. If you string it out, you can see this is the most I could do just using the data, what happens to the genie, and then it comes down. And you can see that, largely speaking, it is true that there's almost no increase in inequality of the genie, apart from some blips up as the second wave takes place. And, um, uh, but always the redistribution is huge. If I was to do this for the 2008 recession, you'd see a completely different story. And in the UK, it's, it's, it's a huge impact on post-transfer 
inequality. So the uh, automatic transfers, the social insurance in the UK, didn't work at all in the 2008 recession. In fact, social insurance has, been, has declined in its structure in the UK since that time. So what happened was there was a completely new invention of a set of social insurances. Some countries had them in place, like Germany, and Germany's been much more successful right across the board, actually, and I'm going to show you how that works. But just going back to, to this, um, nearly all these policies are temporary in nature, and uh, they certainly were in the UK, and in many of them were kind of invented, brought in, and then they, as the furlough system winds down, they disappear, and of course, income is a narrow measure, and Gini is certainly uh, a, a very narrow measure of inequality, so lots is going on underneath that. And the idea is to look a bit more at the, uh, at the, the kind of longer run underlying effects. So what, I, what I've done here, uh, is we're just putting this together, it's for kind of annual reviews, if you ever read annual reviews, a kind of piece to say where are we with inequality during the COVID review, COVID, Deaton review with, with COVID. And so what I've decided, and it, it seems to me to work quite well, is to kind of take a life cycle approach, all economists like this, I do particularly, of developing the impact because um, it kind of runs you through. And typically uh, early years or early impacts can often have the longest lasting impacts and yet they tend to be fairly complementary. We know that if you lose schooling early or qualifications early in, in life, then typically, um, without a lot of remediation, that leads to lower wage profiles, lower career opportunities. And uh, so the loss of learning is quite extraordinary, and loss of training. And I, I'll show you what we've done in the UK and a few other statistics, um, but you'll, you'll, you'll know this. And it's varied strongly by, uh, of course, socioeconomic class, and uh, that seems to be as true in, um, in Spain as anywhere else, as far as I can see. And at work, of course, there's been, um, in economies like the UK, there's hardly any impact on employment or less impact on employment because um, there's been a furlough system to keep people in employment, same kind of thing in Germany. But of course, a big fall in hours of work, and there are many people in employment working zero hours. And for those who don't have university degrees, and even those with university degrees, then most of the wage progression we know from the work that we've been doing, and I'll talk about it, Carlos, tomorrow, uh, is um, learning by doing is almost part of the a large part of the story. So uh, learning by doing in the first few years of your career are absolutely key. And for some groups here, they've lost up to a year or a year and a half of work experience. And I'll give you some statistics on that, which are pretty uh, I I incredible. At the same time, of course, we've had this big expansion of work from home and e-commerce. There's been a strong bounce back because of the vaccine. And so if you just look at, at employment, then it, it looks like things are more almost back to where they were. But if you take the view that human capital matters, the loss of human capital is huge. And we're trying to figure out now how big that is. And of course, to understand the loss of human capital, you have to have some uh, good understanding of the impact of human capital on long-term outcomes in careers and health. Then there's um, the gender effects. Think about those. Um, we know that, of course, many more men have, have, have engaged with childcare, but in all the economies I've looked at, women have still taken the largest share. And so it's been much more damaging, in a sense, for them. And you can see that if you look at the mental health, it's, it's risen most sharply among young mothers especially young mothers um, without university education. Uh, and that's important. And then there's the kind of gaps in the social safety net. The one thing about the pandemic was it hit earnings, it hit people's work and earnings higher up the distribution than a standard recession. 
And so there were a lot, it turns out in lots of economies, uh, those kind of people were not insured through social insurance system. And that's where we want to kind of think about that we need to redesign. And there's the uh, savings. So if I look at loss of learning, I'm just going to go through some statistics. They're not, uh, they're not very causal, I'm afraid. Uh, this is just uh, thinking about what we've found so far. If you look at uh, daily learning time, it's, it, it's extraordinary the difference by socioeconomic class. Um, I guess it, this is the, a completely different thing to any recession. Typically, education is not affected very much during recessions. And so the kind of long-term effects from this recession, if you want to think of it as a recession, are going to be very different from other recessions because, if anything, in standard recessions, there's more investment in education. And to some degree, for those with uh, well-off parents who could work at home, that's actually happened. At least you're going to see some of the inputs. But for most children, it's fallen back, especially for those on lower income. And so... What we've been doing is just using regular um, surveys to kind of find out what's going on with online class, with other schoolwork, private tuition. At primary school, that's up to 11, and then secondary school, which is up to, um, up to 18. And you can see right across the board, there's a gradient in these things. Uh, so one thing we've learned from this pandemic is it was a huge mistake to close schools. Um, and Spain actually did a, a little bit, um, kind of showed that to be the case because, in fact, the infection rates coming from children who were at school were relatively low. And I think it was the, you know, it was in Spain that those statistics first started coming out. But now there's some extremely good, um, almost uh, kind of randomised control styles studies which. I'm not going to go through here, but just going through German states, for example, have different lockdown just to show the transmission rates in schools were not particularly, um, were not as big as we expected. Uh, but nonetheless, even if you're not at school, if you, even if, you, if you're at, at school, of course, if there's a COVID outbreak in your bubble, then you have to take time off. And the amazing thing about home learning while you were in self-isolation is it's even more extreme, the differences by social class. So what happens is that with the uh, richest 20%, um, the, uh, those that could access while they're in self-isolation, uh, online classes, um, video conferences, all those kind of things, were very strongly, uh, you know, strong gradient. Not surprising, really. And then what I can't show you here, but in the survey, they look at what children were doing. And generally, when uh, the low-income the low parent children were online, they were doing much less educational things and typically not involved in, uh, in uh, kind of key learning. And so the interaction of the parent and the child, obviously, is, is key here. I've dug out some statistics here which are... Um, yeah, that should say 2021 at the bottom, which just goes through all European, uh, European, um, you can't see this very well, but you can see the Spanish line, um, which is there. And what it does is just go through a set of statistics on what's available uh, to different children in terms of online access and things like that. It's all I could find uh, that was general. And, and it, it's, um, it, you can see that if you, if you look at online learning and um, limited parental support, which means interaction with parents, it's quite high in Spain, actually. But it's high in many economies. And of course, you realize, um, no great shock, but the great thing about education is that it transfers a lot of knowledge that some parents wouldn't have to children uh, from lower SES backgrounds. Um, there's a study I found in um, Catalonia which uh, just takes that kind of idea and then looks at the, if you, you categorize that in a very simple regression framework and work out the um, opportunities for, uh, for a uh, 
for um, that's kind of a, a, out, a, out of school learning opportunities to learn. That's it, and just and then looks at if you take particular cases, and that's that's done for the Catalonian education system, and it's quite a nice a paper by a bunch of uh, sociologists actually in uh, Barcelona. What you can now start doing is looking at what's happened to test scores. So in the UK, we can now look at the test scores and how they're coming out. Everyone's doing worse by quite a lot. Uh, but those from uh, in schools that have more low, educate, low, uh, low income parents are doing much worse. So we categorize schools by the number of free school meals and we've got the total of all schools and then we can look at what happens uh, before and after. And you get this gradient. But there's a, bit, there's a huge loss, of course, generally, um, in terms of uh, test scores. This is test scores across um, a variety of... Uh, the, the nice thing about the UK at the moment, we, one night administrative data we have is every single school pupil being tracked right the way through their career and so we already had a baseline that we can then look at immediately and there's some uh, great work this is using the Department of Education Statistics but we have all the data but a similar thing if you look at work we've been looking at with Raj Chetty which does a similar thing which is only looking at completed maths lessons and of course they all fall uh, but the ones that fall most are, um, are among the uh, those with uh, Parents in the bottom income quartile. So it's a, it's a similar story, and we're beginning to put together a nice uh, piece of work here. There are some even more detailed and better studies from Netherlands and Germany which are able to do um, some much more systematic uh, causal analysis, which is coming out with very similar work, but I'm not going to go through that here. The biggest... Uh, Loss that I, I can, what, the other thing that concerned me most is 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 lack of human capital experience. Experience for the low educated has a lower payoff, by the way, uh, but it's the only payoff the low educated have in work is experience. Um, and typically, what happens is that they get some qualifications. That typically, work experience with qualification is the key thing, and I, I can show I, I show you that in the papers we're writing, and then we look at what happened for um, in these two lockdowns to the, um, the availability of, um, of um, apprenticeships just completely disappear because you have to be in work to have an apprenticeship. So you're in employment, but you're not actually in the workplace. And although there's some online apprenticeships, they disappeared. I haven't looked at um, Spain or anything there. If you look at what's happening, and the way now we look at it is to not look at unemployment, uh, because lots of people are still employed in furlough in many economies like Germany, UK, but look at the increase in the number not doing any work, zero hours, and they're the, they're the yellow lines here. And where do they really hit? Well, of course, the younger people uh, with lower qualifications. In the UK, there's no evidence that it's particularly male or female, this recession. Uh, the US apparently it is, uh, but not here and uh, not in the UK. In fact, it might be slightly the other way, except for mothers, and I'll come to that. If uh, Looking around Europe, you can see Spain seemed to have the biggest impact, especially among the low um, income uh, group in terms of loss of job and as far as I can tell that's very much to do with the young in particular in hospitality and tourism and those areas in fact there's a lot of geographical work on that the biggest group to get hit was the so self-employed um, they always follow a higher, uh, a higher level that's true in most recessions actually of course there's composition shifts and I've got some real analysis here, uh, but again, Spain and the UK are very similar in levels of self-employed, and in one particular point about the self-employed, and that is uh, solo self-employed, that is what a lot of people call fraudulent self-employed, i.e. you don't employ anybody else, you're just working as used to be an Uber driver in London, but now of course they're, in, they're employed as a worker because of a change of legislation, 
That's quite important, though, because um, you're going to see that's the group that increases a lot and over this period of time. They're hit particularly badly during this recession. And uh, that's the big group. Again, I won't spend too much time, but the employment has risen quite a bit among self-employed in the UK, but it's all among so solo self-employed. It's kind of new work, new work arrangements. And the way new work arrangements have worked through the pandemic is quite interesting because, remember, if you're in a new work arrangement, you don't, you're not eligible for sickness benefit, you don't get any training, and there's, you're almost in the informal economy. And uh, so it's, it's a kind of interesting aspect here. And then finally on, on work, just among those who could work at home, it was always the case that this is highly related to your income. This is when I take out key workers, because some key workers are medics, what have you. If I eliminate those, uh, even with them in, by the way, there's still a gradient, but if I eliminate them, then the sectors not in lockdown are typically strongly related to income, and those who can work from home is also related. And it's, it's kind of interesting uh, that if you look across economies, the, there's completely different impacts. So, Germany seemed to have managed to have almost no gradient, whereas the US and the UK have a strong gradient with uh, the share of workers uh, 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 who lose their job and whether they can work at home. So different, uh, and I've got some more detail here, but that's, uh, that's a kind of interesting comparison. And in fact, if you look at the loss of income over the first wave uh, across the EU, for example, um, then Germany is quite far down, the, the, does relatively well. This is by income group as well. And you can see uh, Germany was relatively successful. Spain sits up there more at, the, the, le, at this end, the, the less good end in terms of outcomes. And so that's, uh, that's important there. Geography has also become very important. And uh, this is um, from Stephanie Stancheva's work on, on which she's done partly with the review, actually, on inequality. And geography matters. If you look at the top line, apart from Luxembourg, Luxembourg, of course, doesn't have any geography at all, because it doesn't. <laughs> it's smaller than London. But, um, but if you look at the UK, there's incredible differences. London is one of the cities in Europe with the most able to work at home. Uh, but, of course, in the northeast of England, which is the most more, a more deprived area, is also the case where you're much less likely to work at home. And this is a kind of common phenomena. I was looking at Spain. On this measure, at least, Spain seems to um, be relatively uh, poor on the ability to work from home. And it's very different between um, the Balearic Islands and Madrid. Uh, and you can see those, uh, those things there. That's turned out to be a really key thing as we go through the pandemic and the review. A feature that we're spending a lot of work on now is just regional disparities in education because education turns out to be a, a hugely important aspect, of course, of inequality going forward, but also at, of how people have dealt with, uh, dealt with COVID. So this is the number of people who are, who are in university or qualified or, or graduated, post, they've graduated with some post-level qualifications. And I've picked on three places. You may not know them if you're familiar with UK geography. Grimsby up on the, in Skegness and Bude down there. You would know them if you're into the politics of the UK because they're all the places that voted Brexit and they just voted um, to throw out the Labour Party and install a Tory party. Um, and what are they? Were well, there places where the achievement, the number of the proportion of a population with, with university degrees, very low. In average, it, in the southeast, it would be up towards 50% or more. Uh, right in those places, it's down much lower, 20% or less, which is important. But the key thing really is the, the way the future graduates move as well. And here's the same picture with dots where the universities are. And what 
the, you know, one feature that we're kind of discovering, which I must say I hadn't thought of before very much, is what we're calling educational flight. And it's, it's very prevalent, of course, in the US. It's particularly extreme in the UK. And it would be very interesting to see how it evolves in other countries. But what, what happens here is not only does Grimsby your chance of getting a university degree if you, if you were born in Grimsby is about half what it is elsewhere, but even if you get it, you won't stay there. Um, and so the, you end up with um, a net loss even among those few who do get degrees. So this, there's these uh, communities which have no... They have young, low-educated and old people in. And um, if you think about the work we've brought together on the way um, skills and good jobs and things interact. If you don't have um, educated in an area, it's very hard to attract good firms. But even more, it's very hard to attract good education, it turns out. Uh, in those areas, you're very much less likely to have a teacher who's qualified in, your, in a particular specialization. So very interesting work on, and I've got some examples here of, the, of those uh, cities. So I'm going to wrap up because, oh yeah, I should wrap up. Um, but just running through the other things on uh, the amount, of, this huge amount of work, of course, on what's happened gender-wise. Uh, and you can see the lines for mothers and fathers. Green is active, orange is passive, childcare. And of course, everyone, both male and female, have increased their childcare but it's really the burden's fallen more on mothers, and that's the kind of key thing we're finding here. If you then look at um, increases in mental health during uh, COVID, uh, it increased a lot for all groups, particularly increased for the, for the young, which are the higher group anyway here uh, in this particular picture, and it's particularly key for young women. And that spike is almost completely dominated by uh, young mothers. And so that, that's a kind of interesting thing to put together here. And then finally, when we come to wealth, um, there's kind of two aspects, important aspects of wealth in most economies that we look at here. One is wealth that's held in, in stock, typically through pension funds, but also through financial savings. And the other is housing. And uh, the UK um, stock market has done particularly less well over this period. It's the lowest one, at least the FTSE 100, 250 is slightly higher. Of course, the US stock, which was in tech, has is done extremely well. And uh, that has had a huge impact on wealth inequalities uh, and indeed on the, on the profits of those superstar firms. Um, and that's been a key case right through this pandemic. Not only have the richer groups, of course, saved more by force because they couldn't do what um, was much less spending on luxuries, uh, but also the price of those assets that they hold have all got, gone up. And housing is very similar, so I, I haven't looked at it in other countries, but in the UK, house prices have, uh, have really lifted off right back to uh, the highest level they've ever seen. And if you look at home ownership by generation and age you can, and family quintile, the one characteristic of the current generations is that they're much less likely to own a home and they're much less likely to own a home if their parents are of low income. And then if you interact this with the house price change, then you can see immediately the impact on family wealth and uh, inheritance and so this is another key aspect of this so if you think about the uh, where we're going with uh, these kind of challenges there's uh, just running through them I, I won't go th through them all but there's educational inequalities uh, and th that's a key part here there's the wage and employment inequalities all really about human capital, as far as I can see. There's some other aspects like mental health, which I haven't calibrated to any payoff here, but we know how to run from human capital through to earnings and earnings progression. 
and either the uh, human capital at school or human capital at work. And that seems to be the key loss during this inequality, which of course leads to these big generational inequalities which are exaggerated through, um, through wealth inequality. Uh, and the only thing to balance that, of course, is health inequalities, but I'm not going to spend t much time on that. What has happened in the UK is, and, and many other economies, in fact, the UK has become a high minimum wage economy, uh, surprisingly, from one that had almost no minimum wage and no minimum wage at all uh, just over 20 years ago. Uh, but it's become the only lever that is really used at the bottom of the distribution. And so the kind of key issue is how to uh, think about levers that can encourage uh, wage progression and those kind of human capital payoffs. And that's exactly what's uh, gone wrong, if you want, during the COVID inequality pandemic. I've been through these. Uh, and uh, the health inequalities, uh, there's a lot of fantastic work in detail that I could show you, but you probably know all of this. Uh, but mortality rates are just much higher among those from deprived backgrounds, and especially for non-white groups. And uh, that's, that's been a kind of key aspect. And I think that's true also around uh, Europe. So when we think about the post-COVID policy, the, 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 in the end, the key thing is educational disadvantage and diverging educational outcomes. And I've kind of listed the way we're going there. All of that's backed up, I think, with pretty good work pre-pandemic, looking at the importance of those uh, returns to those investments. And I guess the key feature of what we've learned is that digital access and space at home has been the, the kind of major reason why the lower income backgrounds have suffered more. And uh, that's been uh, particularly important uh, there. And, and, and then at the same time, we're kind of thinking about how you put together a a, a, a kind of human capital investments for, for good jobs, and that's more or less been my, my whole stream of work at the moment is about career progression and wage progression uh, because that's the thing that's been lacking so much at the bottom of the distribution and really, of course, showed up terribly during this pandemic. And I could go through all those, but I'm going to just put them there. Of course... I didn't want to end on a negative note. Uh, there's some positives here too. Um, in general, they're positives that are really kind of behavioral positives, I guess. Uh, they're things about um, people having experienced, more people having experienced the welfare state and a change of attitudes there. And you do see that. And a, a rethink, certainly in... It, you. European economies, apart from the Scandinavian economies, which all have quite high levels, and Germany, high levels of social insurance. Uh, social insurance in the UK has completely almost disappeared. And so this ability for middle-income individuals to, to uh, get involved in the social, social safety net is an interesting one here. The other thing is that we've had these loss of human capital, so there's almost surely going to be a rethink about the way uh, skills are uh, invested in and the focus on complementing new technologies. I can talk a lot about that, but I, I won't do it, it, do it here. And then I've run through all the other things there, uh, in particular uh, the kind of things I've pointed to on gender, on uh, and also on, uh, on pockets of disadvantage. Uh, again, the pandemic has really picked on Grimsby and these other places as pockets of disadvantage, same in the, in, uh, the US. And so there's a chance that we can uh, think about re-engaging with, uh, with good agglomeration policies in those kind of areas. But of course, there's all these opportunities, and then I, I can't really discuss this without kind of saying, of course, then along comes the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and we're in a completely different world, because it's very unlikely now that we're going to be spending a huge amount 
on these policies. So we're back to the usual really difficult trade-offs. And, um, and in a sense, I think, you know, after all this, this kind of human capital investment uh, policy is going to have to be uh, the major one. And I think we're kind of documented exactly where the losses are and what we could, uh, what we could do to address them. So that's all I'm going to do here. I said, Antonio, it was going to be just to take you through the way we're thinking about um, the inequality challenges as we come into a post-COVID uh, world and what we've experienced through COVID. But I think, you know, um, it's effectively the kind of underlying inequalities that were the big concerns have turned out to be if anything, exaggerated through uh, this COVID crisis. And uh, so, in, in some sense, the kind of early investments in this work was worth it. So I, I'll probably leave it, leave it there with that, with that slide. And if you want to have a discussion, very delighted to do that. Thank you.